Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the invitation to speak here. <coughs> I'm going to give a very old-fashioned talk, with old-fashioned chalk. And I'll start also by a very old-fashioned result from 1854. <laughs> a famous theorem by Cayley, which says that every finite group in bed in Sn, the symmetric group, for some n. Sn, so the symmetric group, being two-generated. It's not very difficult to prove this result. I'm not going to reprove it. <coughs> I want to point out to uh, some consequences of this. And as in the traditional jokes, there's some good and some bad news by that kind of statement. The good news is that if you want to study finite groups, it's enough to study two-generated finite groups, and even some very specific two-generated groups, namely the symmetric groups. And um, the bad news is that there's just nothing you can say about a subgroup of a symmetric group, except that it's finite. There's no structure at all to be said uh, about these groups. Then, um, if you go a little bit uh, further in time, that's 1949. There's a result by Higman and two Neumanns, which say now that every <coughs> countable group, and for Kate, I'm going to write embed with a different spelling, in a two generated. And you can't really put your finger on a nice family such as the symmetric groups. But at least you can do it that way. And the proof proceeds by doing some HNN extensions. This is exactly why they introduced them. At least one reason for introducing them. I do want to point out that this is not an extension of the previous results. Because even if you start by a finite group and apply their machinery, it will give you a two-generated group which is very infinite. Infinite and containing three subgroups, certainly. So there remains the question on whether you can get um, some combination of these, uh, a real extension of this statement. For example, <coughs> you might ask, if this finite group has some extra property, it's a P group, for instance, can you embed it in a two-generated P group? And if you start by a countable group with some extra property, can you put it in a two-generated group with the same property? And this was done later with a different proof this is just the two Neumanns. And they do exactly the same thing. Let me repeat it like this. And say that um, if so preserving. Um, lots of different properties. But for example, preserving solubility. And finiteness. So in particular, their construction says that if you start by a finite P group, you can embed it in a two generated P group. And if you start by a countable soluble group, you can embed it in a two generated soluble group. And in fact, even the solubility classes increases by it was two or three, I don't remember. <laughs> Same thing about finiteness. So their construction really does extend this statement, except that it doesn't really give you some very nice family, such as this one. I do want to point out that you cannot preserve nil potency for a very good reason. That uh, a subgroup of a two-generated nil potent group is still finitely generated. The important groups are what we call uh, no-Ethereum. So um, subgroups are finitely generated. But not a bit like this. Yes. Uh, this, uh, I guess, can be done, but not using this construction either. 
it's quite tricky also. And then there have been quite a few results on working on this statement and trying to preserve extra classes of groups. And tableau 1 means wrong. Stop, stop, stop. Good. Um, let me remember this. Is. So again, to quote some, uh, some names, <coughs> including people in this room, such as John Wilson. You can also preserve residual finiteness. Phillips showed that you can preserve torsion. So if you start by uh, torsion, possibly infinite, but countable group, you can embed it in a torsion to generated group. And uh, most importantly for us, Olshansky and Osin, Olshansky, yeah. um, notice that many other properties can be preserved, in particular, amenability. And also elementary amenability. Well, what I would like to tell you about is some theorem in this vein, which is joint work with Anna Erschler. Down. Mm. Yes. So everything I'm going to tell you is joint with Anna Erschler. Let me put it in the corner. Um, first, a definition about growth of groups. As we saw the last talk by Professor Olshansky, if we have a group generating, generated by a finite set, <coughs> the growth function, we wrote it as g of n, is the number of group elements expressible as a product of s generators. Pressible as of most n generators. And we say the group has sub-exponential growth if this function is strictly smaller than the exponential function, meaning the nth root of g of n tends to 1. And there's exponential growth otherwise. So among these groups of sub-exponential growth, we also learned from um, Slava Grigorchuk's talk yesterday that they could have polynomial growth or strictly larger than polynomial. The polynomial growth groups are well understood by a famous result of Gromov that they are essentially nilpotent groups. So the groups of interest in my talk will be the uh, intermediate growth groups. And we will also say that G, now which does not have to be um, finitely generated, as here, has locally sub-exponential growth. If for every S, contained in G finite, this finitely generated group has sub-exponential growth. Now this is obviously a restriction on subgroups of a group, sub group of sub-exponential growth. The growth of a subgroup is always bounded by the growth of the ambient group. And what we prove is that this is the only restriction. So, theorem, uh, Anna Eschler and myself, which is that every 
group of locally sub-exponential growth. Thank you. So as not to correct what I wrote, if countable, <laughs> embeds in a finitely generated implicitly group of sub-exponential growth. So I intend to give you some ideas on why this is true. I also wanted to start by a few consequences of this. So a simple example, this group of locally sub-exponential growth could be Q, the additive group of the rationals. And this can be embedded in some finitely generated group of sub growth. And in fact, if you, oops. If you try to do this, by hand, it's quite difficult. It's already very difficult to point to some explicit groups of sub-exponential growth. And we're very grateful to Slava Grigorchuk for having given us some examples with this property. <coughs> but then it so turns out that even after his first construction in 1983, there has been essentially no other construction. All the groups that are known to have sub-exponential growth are variants of his group. So you have to somehow build something new or twist or deform or torture an example <coughs> so as to construct this embedding of, of the group you start with, even if it's a group such as Q that you think you understand quite well. Uh, one corollary or consequence, at least, I want to point out is that of distortion. of embeddings. So for this, you start with a metric space that, in the case of interest for us, a group with a fixed generating set. This generating set defines a word metric, namely that for which g of n here counts the balls. So distance between two group elements is the minimal number of generators you have to act upon, say, on the right, to go from one element to the other. <coughs> and you consider embeddings G into Hilbert space. Hilbert space coming with its own metric. <coughs> And phi has to be one Lipschitz. So it contracts the metric, or at least does not expand the metric. And you don't want it to contract too much, the metric. So then you define the distortion. Distortion, that's rho sub phi of t. That will be the infimum on points of distance at most t in the word metric of the group of the distance in the Hilbert space of phi of x to phi of y. An embedding will be called um, uniform in case this distortion is unbounded. So it, by definition, it's an increasing function. And it tells you that if you force the points at the source to be t apart, well, they'll be at least separated by this much, rho of t. 
So uh, a fact is that amenable groups, so in particular groups of sub-exponential growth, embed uniformly. So there's some way of embedding them in such a way. I said it, but I didn't write it. So row unbounded. So there exists phi. Row unbounded. And one might ask, well, how bad can the distortion be? So is it possible to cook up, cook up a group for which um, the distortion is arbitrarily bad. In fact, I should also have said that there are examples of groups which actually do not embed, in the sense that this function is bounded for every, for every phi. But these groups would not be amenable or would not belong to this class. Uh, there was a construction by Arjanseva, Trotsu, and Mark Sapir. Um, giving some groups which have a, a slight weakening of this immutability property. So they do embed uniformly, but for every function rho, there would exist a group which must uh, have a distortion worse, namely growing even more slowly than this function rho given. There was also a construction by Olshansky and Osin to this matter. And what we can show is the following. So, Ashley plus myself. For every row um, increasing, unbounded, there exists a group G of sub-exponential growth. such that its distortion rho phi is less than this given function rho. Uh, this is number. You mean an embedding phi, such that? No, I haven't finished my sentence. Uh, yes, but first I may find. Yes. Such that we have this property for all t large enough and for all embedding phi, one Lipschitz. Yes, you can put there exists a phi because you're always allowed to take phi constant and then nobody will give you a price for this. But it would make this statement. But you want something uniform, right? You want a uniform embedding. I want a statement on all embeddings. I know there exist uniform embeddings because the group has sub-exponential growth. But the distortion is defined for Lipschitz embedding, right? Yes. Yes, so if you're given a one Lipschitz embedding, then the group can be forced to be um, highly distorted. It's just impossible to embed it uh, in a better way than this um, prescribed very slowly increasing function, possibly. Well, we saw some distortion of cyclic subgroups inside an, an ambient group. Here we have a distortion of a subset, which has its own intrinsic metric coming from the word metric, inside the larger space, the Hilbert space. So this uh, construction relies on Arjan Seva Drutsu Sapir, who proceed by uh, taking a sequence of expanders. 
and uh, constructing a group which contains the sequence of expanders. And then also, um, it's used in the paper by Olshansky and Osin that I referred to before. So it's an adaptation of this method. Yes, is this statement OK? Good. So now I would like to tell you a few words on the ideas of the proof and how such things are constructed, how such things are done in the remaining time. A little bit. Oh, this is three. This is not two. What have I been doing? OK, so sketch of proof. Well, in fact, even starting with the original results by the two Neumanns, uh, the idea of proof is first to uh, proceed in two steps. So the step one is that given a countable, oops, B, you can find a countable G. with B contained in the commutator subgroup of G. And the second step is that a given countable G, you can find um, two generated, or at least finitely generated W, with GG in W. The proof by the Neumanns, the proof by the O's, the proof by us uh, also follow this subdivision in two steps. So let's go a, a bit more slowly over step one. For this, the uh, construction by the uh, Neumanns is as follows. You will take G to be the group generated by sequence B minus 2, B inverse 1, B squared, and T. T is the shift. This is inside the wreath product B wreath Z. This is my notation for the uh, full wreath product. So this, by definition, is functions from z to b, semi-direct z. This is a function from z to b, and I didn't quantify over all elements of b. And this is the generator of z. So it's quite clear that um, this is a group. It's given by generators. It's countable, because it's given by countably many generators. <coughs> well, countably plus one. And if you take the commutator of t with this sequence here, well, t acts by shifting on the sequence. So you shift it, invert it, and multiply by the unshifted sequence. Let's call this generator f sub b. Well, an easy computation shows that commutator f sub b with t is the constant sequence. So that's the embedding of B in the derived subgroup of B. Well, a slight problem about this construction is that you don't know much about G except that it's countable. So then there's a, an improvement or a better way of doing it, which is done by the O's. And they will take F, let's me call F prime sub B, which is a step function, like this. And now again, if you take the commutator, f prime b with t, then you've got to shift it, invert, and multiply by the unshifted sequence. 
it will give you a function which is supported at just one point with exactly that value b. So this is the embedding of b in, uh, in the derived subgroup of g. Um, now, in proving our theorem, we cannot do things like that. Because in particular, you see that all these steps give you uh, the uh, restricted wreath product, namely finitely supported functions on, uh, on z extended by z. And this contains uh, sub -semigroup, uh, free sub-semigroups. So in particular, this always has exponential growth. Well, at least one, one property of this embedding, which you see actually directly um, here, directly on the construction, is that G is obtained from B by elementary operations. <coughs> so direct product Um, directed unions uh, and all of this starting with B and Z. We need a small improvement of this first step so as to guarantee that the growth doesn't increase too much. And maybe this is also of independent interest, so I hoped to see a few words on this. <coughs> Let me give you a definition that a group G, so for B a group, We'll say that G is hyper B if G is um, directed limit, directed union of finite extensions of finite powers. And what we actually prove is the proposition that um, there exists a hyper B. So, what do you mean by powers? Cartesian powers. So b cross b cross b, finitely many times, then do a finite extension of this, and then take some union, directed union. Just uncountable directed unions? Uh, well, if b is countable, yes, definitely. You can even make it sequential. It's a fairly general statement, so I didn't want to put any hypothesis on this. There exists a hyper b group g with uh, b contained in the direct subgroup of G. <coughs> so note that a hyper B group will also be of locally sub-exponential growth, if B is of sub -ex a locally sub-exponential growth. Because locally, these things will look like finite extensions of finite powers. And this preserves sub-exponential growth. And the point here, I don't want to go into the, the proof itself, is that there's there's an interesting intermediate object between the, mm. just, just in one word, that if we have a wreath uh, product, so generally A, wreath product 
a permutation group. So this, by definition, is a to the p semi-direct p. Oh, sorry, finitely supported. Mm. Support f from p to a semi-direct p. Then there's the full width product already introduced, which is this one. <laughs> and in between, something that I don't have to give a name to it, but they would be the set of pairs phi p, such that p belongs to p, and phi is a function from p to a with finite image. So it can take finitely many values, but it's allowed to repeat these values infinitely often. So it's not necessarily finite support. And this thing here is going to be hyper A in this construction as soon as P is locally finite. So this is how we do it. We use a sequence of such wreath product extensions. So we can't do an extension by Z, but we can do some extensions by locally finite things with this construction and achieve the result. Good, so this is definitely enough about step one. Let me tell you about step two in the construction. And again, how do the Neumanns do it? Well, they will take a W generated by one function f and the shift element u inside g with z. So here u is again this shift generator, and f is some function. f is a function from z to g, <coughs> which is defined by f of 0 equals, it has to be some element of g, and I'm going to take t, and then I'm going to take some values gi at some positions ni. And this is done in such a way that the gi generates g. It could be even an enumeration of g, because I started by g countable. And the ni are in z, and they have the property that the ni are non-zero, and ni plus nj is not nk for all ijk. For example, a concrete construction would be ni is 2i plus 1 guarantees that this property holds. And then you note that in this group, if you take the commutator of f conjugated by u to the ni with f, this commutator is the function which in 0 has the value gi with t and once everywhere else. So this gives you, in position 0, precisely all these commutators. Well, it's not exactly the whole derived subgroup. It's the commutator of g with the element t. But this is exactly what we needed from the step 1, the fb commutated with t. So this is the second step of the embedding. In fact, there's a quite some more flexibility in this construction. <coughs> so they even stated in their paper we can take a f and I write p because I just want to say I take a generating set of p in g with p. p is now some permutation group or some group. I can take z to give the simplest example, I can take a finite group if 
uh, I can take a finite cyclic group if I want to embed finite groups in two generated groups. And f would be a function from p to g defined by ff1 is, as before, our t element. And f of some elements xi are gi. And here the xi belong to g and have the property that's, well, exactly the translation of this. So xi is not 1, and xi, xj, is not xk. That's the multiplicative notation exactly corresponding to this. <coughs> Sorry? Thank you. Yes. Um, so it doesn't really follow from this construction that W is obtained for elementary operations. And in fact, it's not obtained from elementary operations. In fact, you have to force this, this sequence of Ni's to be a bit more sparse. And the O's introduce uh, the following stronger condition, <coughs> that the set of Xi's, let me call it X, uh, let me call it, say, sigma, should be um, parallelogram-free. <coughs> So this means, just said it in words, that if you take elements A, B, C, D with A different from B, B different from C, C different from D, D different from A, then A, B inverse, C, D inverse is not one. So you don't see things like a parallelogram in the Cayley graph. But uh, maybe slightly more intuitive in, in all cases, what's really used is the following um, equivalent statement, which is that sigma intersect sigma translated by an element g has size at least one, uh, at most one. Now, your function f will be supported on a parallelogram-free set. And this guarantees that if you look at f and f shifted by some element, they will overlap only at one point. And at this one point, you will get a commutator. And this guarantees, again, that w is obtained by elementary operations. Let me call it LM in terms of P and G. So again, this is a, this is a wreath product with a presumably infinite group, if you need an infinite parallelogram-free set. And these wreath products always have exponential growth. So here, we need um, a modification of the construction to prove our theorem. And this is slightly more tricky. So in the remaining five minutes, I should tell you about this. Um, this is going to be the last board. Let me put it here. So for this we need permutational with products. In fact, W is again going to be of the form generated by F and P, but now this is in G wreath above X with P, and P a group acting on X. So this, by definition, is functions from X to G semi-direct P, with a natural action at the source on functions. And we need some generalization of the uh, parallelogram-free sequences. <coughs> so for this, we'll take a sigma contained in X, parallelogram-free. And for this, well, I write exactly the conditions that, um, that we need so as to obtain the commutators. Free, which means that for every X, and y in sigma, there should exist a group element g in p, which sends x to y. And also, well, if I translate sigma by g and intersect with sigma, well, I could uh, force this to have just one element. But this is far too strong. I will 
ask this to be contained in, well, just one element, and this one element is going to be y, union, a fixed point of sigma. A uh, fixed point of g. Yes. So that's the, that's the equivalent uh, of parallelogram free that is required for these permutational with products. And now, <laughs> the point is that we can choose uh, p and an x, which guarantee that we still have uh, sub-exponential growth at the output of the construction. So for this, p will be the first Grigorchuk group. Uh, acting on a tree. And x will be the orbit of a ray of this ray. And it first turns out that there are uh, such parallelogram free sequences. So I could take, for example, sigma to be the set of sequences that just do this and then this. So finitely many segments this way, and then infinitely often this direction. That's an explicit construction <coughs> that can be done. <coughs> and now, <coughs> uh, for the construction, well, let me say that this is enumerated as the set of xi. <coughs> I will um, uh, take G and it's generated by some GIs <coughs> and define F by F of X sub, and now I must take a sparse subsequence of these, NI with GI pass subsequence. of sigma. Now the point is that for these permutational wreath products, if f is finitely generated, uh, sorry, if f is finitely supported, then, well, let me even say it more directly. Uh, the uh, restricted wreath product. So G wreath P is, has some exponential growth. If G is finitely generated and sub exponential growth. And this comes from a study of the orbits. And in fact, something we call inverted orbits of the group G on the set. Well, G here. Let me call it H because there may be some confusion with the previous one. P is always fixed to be the first we got to group so as to uh, simplify slightly the notation. So these groups always have sub-exponential growth. And in one word, the reason is that to understand the growth of a uh, wreath product, you have to understand how the support grows. The support of the functions from x to g. And these supports grow sublinearly in the word uh, length. It's because supports grow sublinearly. And now the point is that if we look at the group Wi, which is generated by Fi and P, and Fi will be the truncated function. So Fi of x sub n of j is gj for all j less than i, and other values are 1. This is a finitely supported function. I only keep the first 
i values. <coughs> so this has some exponential growth. And um, wi and w agree on very large balls. So on large balls, the size of the ball being a function of i. So this group here comes from an infinitely supported function. <coughs> but uh, the Cayley graph really resembles that of a finitely generated uh, function. Uh, well, what comes from a finitely generated function and uh, the group P. So has uh, uh, sub-exponential growth. Good. So uh, this is the sketch of the proof. Thank you. Are there any questions? Can you say two or three words about uh, distortion? Super space distortion. Ah, oh, oh, yes. So, about distortion, well, there are finite groups. For example, Hi would be the uh, SL3 FP bracket T modulo i congruence subgroup. So these are known to be expanders, and they are known to have very bad embedding properties. So if you're given these explicit groups with explicit generators, you have the property that there exists an M such that for every family of embeddings, phi i from the hi in Hilbert space, one Lipschitz, Um, the distortion is, well, the function is bounded by m. So now the statement is, so for every t, there exists i, there exists x, y, and h, i, so that the distance in h, i from x to y is at least t, but the distance in the Hilbert space of the images, so phi i x, phi i y, is at most m. Uh, this was proven by Laforgue, in fact, in the strongest statement that not just Hilbert spaces, but Banach spaces of given uniformity. And then what we take is B, the restricted direct product of the HIs. That's a countable group. It contains all the HIs. And by this procedure, we embed it in a finitely generated group W of sub-exponential growth. And we control well enough the Lipschitz constants so as to uh, make the embedding worse than uh, any row that we are given to start the construction. Can you preserve that problem if it is decided on? Uh, so all of these steps. Yes, we'll give you something that's... The point is, so can you, can you produce a computable, uh, computable sequence sigma? And can you produce a computable subsequence ni that guarantees the sparseness? So if the word problem is solvable, the growth function is computable. I think this is your result, isn't it? <laughs> then if the growth function is, is computable, then you know exactly how sparse these n of i's have to be. In fact, all of this is quite quantitative. So if I want these groups here to agree on a ball of radius m of i, then I know exactly how large n has to be as a function of the subgroup generated by the first, well, the first gj's, so g1 up to gi. So if the word problem is solvable, uh, you can compute this growth, you can determine what ni is, you know here's an explicit construction of a sigma, and then, indeed, you can preserve the word problem. Are there any other questions? Well, then we'll
convene again tomorrow and let's thank uh, Laurent again.